excluded, overlooked, discarded, abandoned. These are the labels given to those the world deems inferior, lesser than. But Jesus took the wisdom of the world and turned it upside down. He embraced the untouchable, brought hope to the desperate. When others avoided, he drew close. Where others cast judgment, he offered forgiveness. Jesus' actions seem foolish in the eyes of the world, but to encounter the foolishness of God is to encounter true wisdom, a wisdom that begins and ends with Jesus. Thankful you chose to be here today. We're continuing our series going through the Gospel of Luke. And we've been looking at it from different viewpoints. Now we're looking at those who have been rejected by the world and see how Jesus looked and loved and cared for and reached out. And as followers of Jesus, we each need to have the heart of Jesus and loving and seeing people the same way he does. So we're going to begin reading in the Gospel of Luke. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to the 13th chapter. And we're going to see a setting again where Jesus reached out to someone, this time someone who was overlooked by the others in that crowd. Luke chapter 13, beginning with verse number 10. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and there was a woman who had had, had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. And so in this crowd of people, he's in a synagogue somewhere in the northern area of Galilee. It doesn't tell us what town it is, but there's some of the religious leaders that are there, and there's a crowd of people all coming to hear this rabbi. This Jesus had been teaching now for a few years. The crowds had gathered. They were anxious to hear him, and it says there was this one lady in the crowd. Verse 12, when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath. That's just, just a bizarre scene. Jesus is... A crowded room, he's teaching from the word of God, and he sees a lady who has this disability, he calls her out, he heals her, and the synagogue leader is upset over it. And he actually says to the people, there's six days you could do this, but you should not be doing it on the Sabbath, because this is a day of rest. Now the Sabbath was a law in the Old Testament, it was a day of rest, it was a day of celebration, but it was not ever meant to be a day of burden. This guy obviously cared more about other things, his rules that he cared about the people. Look at Jesus' response in verse 15. Then the Lord answered him, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead him away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan had bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? He's saying, you care more about your donkey than you do care about this lady. He's saying, you're so legalistic if I can't do any work, but yet you will take your donkey to go get a drink of water and not consider that okay. But for us to be caring for this lady, you would not do that. His, his eyes were completely wrong. He's a hypocrite. In verse 17, Jesus said, as he said this, Jesus, as he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. And all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. This man cared more about the rules than he did about the people. Let's go back to verse number 12, some things in there that Jesus did. First of all, it says that he saw her. And we see this over and over. Jesus sees you. He notices people that other people cast aside, other people overlook. And when he saw her, he saw a woman. He saw a person who had a disability. The disability is an adjective describing something about her, but it doesn't say who she is. You are not a disabled person. You may be a person that has a disability, but that does not define you 
and set you apart. Jesus saw her for who she was. And then it says he called her over. He called her. He called her and said, reach out to her. No doubt the big crowd of people when he says, hey, would you come up here? I want to talk to you. She might have been a little bit embarrassed, a little bit nervous, but she probably felt incredibly honored. Of all the people, Jesus saw her, and he called her up to her, and then it says he touched her. He laid his hands on her. He cared for her. We see a few weeks back how he touched the person with leprosy, when this, with a skin disease that no one wanted to be around. He touched the people with, with sin issues in their life that other people didn't want to be close to. Jesus cared, cared so much that he gave them that touch that says, I value you. And he does more than that. He heals her. He gives her the freedom that is there. He, he provides for her, and her response is that she prays. Sometimes when we're around people who are different, we just kind of want to look the other way, or it's awkward, or we ignore. But Jesus calls him forward and, and touches and heals him. And then as a result, he also gives her value. Down in verse number 16, when it's, he calls her daughter of Abraham. That's just something we would just go, oh, that's kind of a weird thing and pass on. But it's unique because that's the first time this phrase we ever see it in the Bible. Different times we see sons of Abraham when there's some man of notoriety or significance or brought out to importance and says, he is in the line of Abraham. He, he's, he's given value. But Jesus looks at this lady and calls her a daughter of Abraham. He's saying she has significance. She's of value in the eyes of God. In the sense of your lineage, that was important to the people back in that day. He was saying that she is someone to be valued when he was pointing that out to the religious leader, the synagogue leader. So he sees these people, he recognizes what they are, and he says, these people, everybody is important. And he does the same thing for you. He sees you, he calls you, he touches you, he gives you value, he knows where you're at in life. And the struggles that you've come in with today. And as a follower of Jesus, the question is, do we see people the same way Jesus does? Or do we do like those religious leaders or perhaps many people in the crowd and just completely overlook her? We're busy trying to see Jesus ourselves. We want to get close. We have needs. We want those. Do we actually overlook and bypass the people or not respond to them in the, in the same way that Jesus would, but as the synagogue leaders do? Here in the church, we have a, a member. Her name is Mariah Broker. Are you here, Mariah? Uh, there you are. Okay, wave your hand real big. This is Mariah. All right. Now, she's just a person in the church, but she's got a love for Jesus and love for the people. And a few weeks ago as we were preparing this, she came by and talked to Nicomas, and he wrote some things down, and I called her and said, can I share this stuff with you? So I'm going to share. She works in a music department in a school and helps with music therapy with kids who have disabilities. And I appreciated, Mariah, your summary, and it says it so well. So this is what Mariah says, and it's some truth that we can need to understand. It says, most people with disabilities aren't just struggling with their disability. They're struggling with secondary struggles caused by the disability. Things like anxiety and shame, inferiority, fear, rejection, loneliness. God may not heal the physical disability this side of heaven, but he can for sure heal the secondary disability this side of heaven. Thank you. Well said. We all have those secondary disabilities. We have those in many ways, and we are concerned about those, but for some reason we look at someone who has a physical disability or something that sets them apart differently, and we just kind of back off, and we see the one, but we don't recognize the heart and the value and the love that everybody has and they need. And it's hard for us to understand how to reach out, but we certainly don't want to be guilty of what the synagogue leader did and overlook the person because we're more concerned about our rules than we are about the people that are there. The one phrase back in verse 11 or verse 10 as it starts out it says that the lady was disabled by Satan. It was a dis dis disabling spirit given to her by Satan. And people don't know what to do with that. Theologians argue that back and forth. Some would say that she was demon-possessed, that Satan put this on her, Satan caused it. Others would say it's part of this fallen world that we're in, that all of us suffer with disease and brokenness and heartache. And that's part of what it's saying, that Satan was the cause of it. We don't know for sure what it is. But one thing we have to be very careful of is that we don't look at someone and judge, ah, they did that. Something happened in their life, and that's why this came about. Because that's not true. In John chapter 9, we have a story where there was a man who was blind. In fact, he had been blind from birth. And the followers came to Jesus and they said, well, who caused this? Did this man's own sin do it or was it the sin of his parents that caused this to happen in his life? And Jesus very clearly said, neither one of those. 
It's not a result of sin in this person's life. In fact, Jesus turned around and it says, he has this, but God is going to be glorified in his life. And God did some incredible things for this man that he ended up result, the testifying to God's goodness in his life. So we have to be very careful that we don't judge people and size them up because they're going through some difficulties in their life. And sometimes we do that against ourselves. We think, what did I do to cause this? What's wrong with me that this comes on my life? Just a couple of things I want to talk about on this. One is from the book of 2 Corinthians. We see Paul going through a very difficult struggle in his life. And, and Paul had a heartache. and We don't know what it is. But there was something going on that he struggled with. And it was called a thorn in the flesh. Listen to this. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning with verse number um, 7 here. There was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Now, thorn in the flesh, so many times people speculate what it is. Some would say, there's other times that we give this hint that Jesus, or that Jesus, that Paul had an eyesight problem of some kind. So they're saying, that's what he's referring to. Other times they say, no, it must have been such a, something much stronger that was just really knocking him down, some kind of a disability that he struggled with. He doesn't say what it is. Others would say, because he said it was of Satan, that it's some kind of a temptation or maybe even an addiction of some kind, that he was just a struggle, this turmoil. Whatever it is, there's something in his flesh, either in the sense of materialistically or his body that he struggled with, and he was pleading, God, would you please take this away from me? Verse 9, but he said to me, Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. So he's pleading, saying, God, would you please take this away from me? And you can read this and put in whatever it is that you're struggling with in the flesh, whether it's a physical disability or an emotional struggle. You can put it in there and say, God, would you please take this away from me? Sometimes he does and sometimes he doesn't. And his answer is, my grace is sufficient for you. Because he says, in your weakness, his power is strong. So when you can't figure it out, when you can't handle it, when you can't do it, then what do we do? We're saying, God, I need you. I need your strength. Now, at the end of verse 10, it says this, when I am weak, then I am strong. When we're at that point where we're knocked down, when we can't fix it, when we can't get around it, those low points in our life, many times when we say, God, I need you, and when we do that, his grace is strong. It says his grace is sufficient, it is. And by God's grace, it gives me strength. Whatever it is you're struggling with today, maybe just being overlooked, maybe there's some real struggle going on, and realize that in your weakness, you claim the power of God and it gives you strength. Now, we may not all be healed physically, but there's reason to celebrate, and that is to celebrate God's goodness, what he does for us, and to realize he sees you, he cares for you, he calls you out, he wants you to be free of the bondage that's holding you back, and realize that this disability, this pain, this disease that's going on, you are a child of God no matter what. In Romans chapter 8, we see another point where Paul is writing about the difficulties of this world. He says this in verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. He's saying whatever it is that we're struggling with right now, and it's hard. The word sufferings is a strong word. The suffering that I'm going through right now. Compare it to the glory that we're going to see when we see Jesus face to face. In the next few verses, it talks about creation. The world around us, it said it groans to be restored because God designed this world to be perfect. But sin has entered and causes problems all around and disease. It says creation longs for the day God will restore it. And then verse 23, it says, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. And it begins talking about the hope that we have when we will see Jesus face to face and we will be restored mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and certainly physically to the new body. And we long for that. Verse 26, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans, with words that cannot be expressed. You ever had that point in your life when you just say, God, I don't know what to pray anymore. You're just exasperated. 
you're at the point where you just go, God, I prayed and I prayed. I don't know how to pray anymore. Then you just say, God, I need you. I need your strength. And I put my hope in you. And it says the Spirit intercedes for us because God's presence is within you. And he restores that hope. Again, verse 24. For in this hope we were saved. The hope that's there. Realize that God's grace gives me hope. I have hope in this world, but I have the promise of hope which is to come. And that hope stirs you on. When you get to the point where you're out of hope, you're hopeless, it's a horrible place to be. As a follower of Jesus, know that he loves you and he vows you and he gives you grace. And his grace gives you strength. His grace gives you hope. The Pharisees, they did not even see this lady. They were so busy with all their stuff. The synagogue leader, they were just busy doing their thing. And I think many people in the crowd probably didn't see her either. And we can be guilty of not looking at the people around and giving value. I believe people are overlooked because we're blinded by our selfishness and our sin many times. We don't notice people are hurting. We don't notice people that are struggling because we're caught up on our own world and issues around us. So people are often overlooked, but Jesus always sees us, and he calls calls us to himself. So I want you to know today, whatever it is that you're going through, Maybe you're in the crowd at work or in your school or your family or in this, in this room today and you just feel like you've been overlooked. I've come in and nobody's talked to me at all today. But God sees you and he's called you here today and he gives you value and we want you to have the strength and the hope that's yours. But for all of us, we want to be reminded to look outside of ourselves and notice some people around. I thought today something that might would help is if just... If I had a friend just come out and share with you a little bit from a personal viewpoint. So I've asked Matt Newbold, who's been a member here for a long time, just a good friend, just to come out and share a little bit and talk from his heart about what it feels like from his perspective in this world. And I think maybe help us understand some things too. So would you welcome Matt to the platform? Come up here, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it, but you know it's not for me, it's for God. I'm That's just, right. I'm just the one providing his message. So. Well, I'm glad you came to join the message today. It's a lot more fun than just me by myself up here. It's good. So this is <laughs> yeah. Matt. Matt uh, usually is in the 9 o'clock service, and he volunteers in children's ministry 1045, so this is the 1045 service. Yes. And uh, by the way, uh, Friday was Matt's birthday. Say happy birthday, Matt. <laughs> You, we didn't get invited to your party for some reason. Yeah, you didn't. No, I didn't. All right. All right. We'll just let that drop there. All right. So, Matt, you've been around here for a while. Um, yeah, we knew yes, you when you were just this little snotty-nosed kid running around having fun. And so things have changed in your life. And so Ob- just tell... Obviously. Yeah, they have. So uh, tell us a little bit about your story. Um, okay, so... Uh, I was I was born in the uh, mid '80s um, with a degenerative genetic disorder. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, a, doc- a doctor's prognosis is um, uh, uh, it, it'll it'll by the nature of the word it'll progressively get worse. Uh, as as he ages, mm-hmm. and um, obviously it's done his job. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know how it goes with all cases, but um, thankfully it uh, has not. It has progressed at a slow rate. So okay. um, by by middle school, like before middle school, I could you know run and jump and everything, just little off balance and then by uh by middle school i was was in a wheelchair and um well i'm here uh it's brought me to where i am today so so how's how's your walk with god been through all this um well uh um in my in my early years it was it was actually kind of tough because um, I was, well, like everyone, I was a stupid little kid and um, <laughs> everyone thought he uh, 
And, and on top of that, I was, I was thrown into this world, obviously, uh, like this, and no explanation. So um, there, was a, there was a time there where, um, I'm ashamed to say, I, I really um, uh, did, not, did not have the greatest appreciation for God. And... Um, you know, just trying to deal with it. But um, I, I find, um, yeah, the second, second best decision I ever made was, I, so at one point I was like, you know what, there's no making the situation better. Um, and there's, there's no way you're gonna, you're gonna fix this. So, um, and um, he decided not to not to leave that emotional baggage behind, and um, just made life a whole lot easier. It does so. Um, yeah. He's walking with you. So how do how do you say um, every day? How do you how do you get along with God? Um, pre- pretty well, I would say. Like I um. I, uh, yeah, well, everyone depends on him every day, but, um, I feel, I feel maybe in, in my case and a lot of other people in my situation, uh, they, the, the feeling is amplified because we are, we're actually, and I hate that word because I don't like to segregate us, right. um, but, uh, we are actually confronted with obstacles every day. Right. And um, at least for me, like, um, I could not do it on my own. So um, I uh, fully trust in him, and he helps me with whatever I come upon. You've worked really hard accomplished. You've not let this stop you a whole lot. Matt recently got his degree in business and he accomplished a lot. Yep. I'm proud of him for that. Yep. And, and by the way, this, he is very smart, intelligent. He's looking for a new job. So if you know something that's there, I'll put a plug in for you. All right. But proud of you and what you've done. So what, what advice would you give us as far as if we see someone who is struggling with a disability of some kind and um, what, what, what would you say to us? Well, how should we react or respond? Uh, you know, if you, if you uh, feel so inclined to take the time out of your day, just come up and talk to us. It's not like we're, we're aliens from outer space. I mean, <laughs> we live on this planet, too. We have, the, we have the same problems as anybody else. So... Um, uh, if if you do take the time, I think I think um, you would be uh, pleasantly surprised in what we could what we could um, offer in terms of friendship and um, just right. insight in the thing. That's right. You can be a good friend. So in the story, Jesus, we said Jesus gave the lady value. So what is it that I can do to give you value? Well, you can give me 20 bucks. Okay. <laughs> uh, Gene, take care of that, all right? <laughs> well, that, that would help. Besides money, what else? <laughs> well, um, just, it just goes along with what I said before. It's like just, just you know, um, come up and talk to us. We have, we have uh, you know, we... We're God's people. We might be in a different package, but um, we're just like everybody. We have we have things to offer. So, right. um, so if I see you somewhere, I should just say hi. Start with that, like I would anybody else. Yeah, it's a good start. <laughs> yeah, that's a good start for <laughs> everyone. All right, I love Matt. He's a great guy. Would you tell him thanks for joining us this morning on stage? Thanks.
yeah, yeah. I, I would stand and bow, but, you know. <laughs> There's people around you every day. Sometimes, you know, I see Matt, I, I just don't know what to say. I did, can you do what he said? Just say hi, stop. It means don't be so busy rushing around. And there's no doubt every person in this room has felt overlooked or bypassed and just went around. That's a hard place to be in. And I can say we have some friends around who feel that in a very, very strong way. And I encourage you today, this week, say, well, I'm going to be a follower of Jesus. And this week, our word is, just think of that word overlooked. Think of people that otherwise are passed by. And we can do the same things. We can walk in today and be so caught up in the things that we like and don't like and sizing things up and all this garbage and junk we start thinking about and we just miss the people that are sitting all around you. And I'm sorry if you came in today and no one said hi to you because everybody was so busy with their friends and everybody else. And I hope that all of us were open our eyes. Just be kind, be gracious. But more than just the hi, Ask someone their story, get to know them a little bit, and reach out and demonstrate God's love. When we do that, we're going to do a great deal in helping people's hearts heal and they come to know who Jesus is. Just a couple of comments, wrap this up. If you feel overlooked, I hope that you open your eyes to the hope that's there. And the hope is real. And the hope is in Jesus and his grace that he loves you and he values you. And I'm sorry if that hasn't been demonstrated to you well in the past, but as a church body believers, we want to learn to demonstrate that very well to you. I want you to know that this love of God for you is real, no matter the circumstances you're in. And if you know about this hope, then I pray that you will open your eyes to those that are overlooked around you. We know it's there. We know it's, we know it's true all about Jesus. Then let it sink into your heart. Ask Jesus to open your eyes. And this week, notice people. And even if it's awkward, you don't know how to do it, just stop, say hi. If it's at the gas stations, at the store, at your work, at your school, there's people around that this week, if this church, all services, if we committed, we're going to notice and see thousands of people in our community can be touched with the love of God. And that will make a difference in their lives and in the kingdom. God, I'm thankful for Matt for his story and Father for the many people that he represents Father thank you that he loves you and honors you and Father I'm thankful especially for this story in the Bible of Jesus and how this demonstrates his character and his heart and how he loves each of us Father I pray that you speak to the person in this room who has been overlooked and who's born in the flesh, whatever that may be, has just overwhelmed them. And God, I pray that in their weakness, in our weakness, that we would know your strength through your grace. And Father, your grace would grow in our hearts that it would be sufficient for all of our needs. And Father, I pray that you give us your hope, restore us in who you are and how you work in our lives here on this earth and the hope that we have that we'll see you and be restored someday. And Father, forgive us when we are so busy and caught up on our own selfishness that we don't notice the people that are around. And I pray this week your spirit would open our, high, our eyes and our hearts and give us courage to share and talk, embrace and touch. Father, give us opportunity to share your love and your grace more than your rules this week. I pray that you would make a difference in this community and in this city because believers in this church will love as you love. So Father, would you speak to us now? In Jesus, I pray.